Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Doomer Optimism Podcast. Today, we're going to have a great discussion about um, disaster preparedness and existential risk with uh, Scott James, Charlotte Cecil, and S.J. Beard. I'm going to let you all inter introduce yourselves um, so that I'm not talking for the next 15 minutes. Um, but let's start with you, Scott, because you're first on my uh, on my my little uh, box of heads. <laughs> All righty. Uh, my name is Scott James. I'm calling you guys from uh, a little island called Bainbridge Island. <clears throat> it's a, a 30 minute ferry ride outside of Seattle. So I'm on the west coast of uh, North America. And um, I have been involved in community preparedness for a little over a decade. Um, uh, I came at this through permaculture. So Trey and I instantly have a food geek <laughs> connection. Um, and uh, from, the, from permaculture and group resilience, it's one step into community preparedness. And uh, I ended up going deep geek on it and starting a nonprofit related to it and a book uh, related to it. And um, I'm super excited for today's conversation. Excellent. What's the title of the book? The book's called Prepared Neighborhoods, uh, which kind of gives it all away in the title as to what I think the sweet spot is for community engagement. Um, I there's a bunch of books out there for individual preparedness, and there's a bunch of books up at the state federal level, and there was nothing in between, like focused on a city or the building blocks of a city, which is our neighborhoods. Um, so I ended up write, researching and writing a book on that on that focus. Yeah, I've always been really fascinated by Toby Hemingway's like kind of bookend yeah. books. He's got Gaia's Garden, which is yeah. home scale permaculture. And then right before he died, he released, released Permaculture City. And I'm kind of like, OK, that's an interesting, um, yep. kind of, uh, you know, scope to his career. Right. Yeah. Neat progression, kind of similar to what you're doing with Roots Down, where you can start with individual building blocks and then you start to get them together and together. And uh, now you're making affecting massive change on a much larger scale. Yeah, excellent. All right, Charlotte, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, um, Charlotte Cecil, uh, based in Ontario, and um, I, along with my co-founder, Sophie, who uh, couldn't join us today because she's traveling, um, we launched a platform last year for um, community resilience and um, community-based disaster risk management. It's called Thrive Spring. And uh, basically it's a, a, a place where people can connect to work together on getting their communities more prepared, resilient and self-sustaining. Um, and if nothing, you know, the, the way we see it is you, if you do all these um, things to make your community more, more resilient and nothing happens, there's no, there's no emergency, you, 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 you still benefit from it, from all, from all, the, all the connections, all the, all the, um, the, the, the bonding and, and getting to know people. And then if something does happen, um, you're obviously much better off if, if people are, are, are working together to respond. Yeah, I'm always really fond of that, um, that single panel cartoon that's like, they're at a climate change conference, this person stands up and he's like, but what if we make the world a better place for nothing? You know, and so <laughs> I always really like, you know, the idea that we're building these communities and they're gonna mm -hmm. be better even if the worst doesn't happen. Um, right. So, yeah, lovely. And we'll get into Thrive Spring, I'm sure, later on. You can kind of discuss a little bit about that, Charlotte. SJ, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm SJ Beard, and I'm Academic Program Manager and Senior Research Associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, which is uh, an interdisciplinary research institute, uh, part of the University of Cambridge, where we look at everything with the potential to bring about human extinction or civilization collapse. Um, but I, I also, people have been talking about their communities, and one of the communities I belong to is this really, this really small but diverse and super interesting community of people who devote their professional lives to researching how, you know, ways the world might end, to put it in kind of cinematic tones. But I also, you know, I'm also contacting you as, or, or being on here as a representative of the community of Histon in Cambridgeshire, uh, which is just an amazing uh, village where I live, a sort of really quaint little English village. Um, but I think it must be one of the most densely social capitalized places in the world because mm. It has, it's very close to Cambridge, and we have a lot of Cambridge researchers, scientists, or people who are working in technology companies related to the university. Uh, but we also have uh, a factory where a large 
percentage of our country's jam and jelly and processed fruit products all go through here. Histon was built around uh, a large uh, jam business, Chivers, uh, which is at one point one of the largest jam makers in the world. And that's kind of been bought up and bought up and bought up, but we still have this massive jam factory in the middle where so much uh, fruit produce that goes all around the world is made. But then we've also got lots of really weird things like the International Whaling Convention, uh, who were responsible <laughs> for the moratorium on whaling. They're based in Histon and Impington or the Internet Watch Foundation that take down you know, sites for depicting child pornography. They're, they're here. Uh, we've got one of the largest agricultural research stations, the National Institute for Agricultural Botany. Um, and then we've got lots of sort of really amazing little enterprises. A friend of mine who has a, uh, a, a company who go and do community engagement on sustainability issues all over the world. And she will be brought in by, you know, governments and businesses and people who say, we want to, you know, we want to engage with a hard to reach or a, a quite uh, divided community, you know, come in and run the process of how we can do that successfully. Uh, or, you know, another friend of ours who has a, a, a leather making business in their back garden and, it's just, I, I cannot believe the kind of, the diversity of people who do amazing things all over the world who are now just the friends of the children in my, uh, you know, in my children's school, uh, their mm -hmm. parents uh, are, are related to all of these things. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I feel I'm representing both of these communities, the kind of really global and elite, but also the very local and amazing because of the, the the kind of breadth of everything from the people who make jam to, you know, people who are making decisions about the world's biosphere. Yeah, <laughs> that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, SJ. I, I think like, you know, that really kind of gets to the heart of it, right? Is that you, it mm. sounds like y'all are largely like you're thinking locally or, or, or thinking globally, acting locally, right? Well, uh, right. And I think one of the things that Histon has got is that Cambridge is a really kind of destination place, but it's really flat and the flood risk is really high. And Histon is on a really, really, really low hill, right? You wouldn't even notice it, but it's 15 meters above sea level. You know, most of the landscape around us is at sea level or some of it's even below sea level. And so I think a lot of what has attracted people is just you want to be in Cambridge, but this is the kind of the highest ground and the most protected from climate change. Mm, uh, the and, specific and so we, neighborhood we come together, like... you know? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't there is part of it part of the area was underwater for a long time, wasn't it? A lot long, long oh, yeah, time. Yeah. The uh, fens? No, yeah, the, the fence was drained uh, 300 years ago. And there's this amazing footpath just right by my house that's uh, over a thousand years old. We know that when hmm. King William uh, invaded England, they used that footpath to march to Ely because the fens were, you know, they were completely underwater at the time. And there was only one safe road that you could march a lot of people without them all sinking into the mire. Uh, the, it's called the Fen Causeway, and it's still there, but no one uses it anymore because now we've drained the fence, and there are all lots and lots of roads and footpaths on it. But you know, there may well come a point where the odd geology of this, and it's it's not even straight. It has this big long arc that goes all over the fence because that was just where the land was slightly higher and the drainage was slightly better. Uh, but yeah, it may it may you know someday become a really important throughway again, even though right now it's it's a sort of very muddy little footpath. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot of history around here like that. Well, that's really interesting. Um, so here at here at Doomer Optimism, you know, we really like, you know, the idea behind it is really that like, um, in order to become optimistic, in order to find hope, in order to take action, you kind of have to accept the doom, accept that there are there are se several existential crises all kind of happening at the same time, and that we need to find a path forward for as many people as possible. Um, that is, you know, not just survival, but why not make the world a better place while we're at it, you know? Um, so let's start with the doom and I'll start with you, SJ. Uh, how are we all gonna die? <laughs> How's the world gonna end? Well, I mean, this is always a really interesting question because people assume that I'm, you know, I must be a really pessimistic person, but I always say I, I work in existential risk. Right, I'm concerned about the things that might happen, uh, which is very different. I think a lot of people who enter this, you know, this field and they start thinking about these things, your mind has got to be kind of naught or one. Either it's going to be really terrible or it's going to be absolutely fine. And you hear this a lot in kind of the way people talk about climate change or the way people talk about, you know, pandemics or something. Either it's going to be a massive disaster or it's not going to be anything. You know, our future is 
our future is gray and we are making many decisions right now that will make our futures worse. Uh, but most of the decisions that we make are only gonna make it slightly worse. Uh, it's just that we keep on making bad decisions. And so it gets worse and worse over time. And I want us to start making the decisions that are gonna make it better and better over time. And when you think about it like that, it's like, there's not, there's not the one thing that is necessarily gonna kill us all. What, what happens is, uh, you know, too many short-term decisions, too much externalizing the costs and internalizing the benefits, you know, taking all the profits and making someone else to pay to clean up the pollution or deal with the, you know, social unemployment or whatever it is. And that just adds up to a future that's not, uh, it's not going to sustain humans, right? It's not sustainable in that there isn't actually any more place for us in this future. But we have to do a lot of things wrong to get there because we are, you know, a really creative and adaptive and resilient and cooperative species. Our, our, you know, we have amazing capacities, uh, but we we need to be using those a lot better if we want to build good futures. And so that's the way I, I see it. I'm I'm not really, I think about how humans can go extinct and how civilizations can collapse, but I am really quite irritatingly, you know, cheerful and optimistic about it. I'm not I'm not much of a one for doom. Yeah, well, Jay, that would be a great that'd be a great tagline to put on your business card is irritate <laughs> irritatingly positive. <laughs> Yeah, That's I was, was going to say, SJ, that that really was a disappointing answer. I'm really, I'm really sorry I <laughs> yeah. started with you. I was really yeah. hoping for. Well, it's gonna, it's gonna end in a gigantic fireball, Trace. <laughs> um, what are you, what are you seeing, Scott? On you know, you're on the complete opposite end of the country from me. Um, what, what are you seeing from your your perspective? Well, uh, I, I think of it like this, just like I think that there's probably not that magical silver bullet that's going to solve everything from an environmental standpoint or a societal standpoint. I think the same is true on the other end. There's probably not a single event that is going to take us down. It's it's similar to what SJ is referring to as there's multiple events, there's overlapping fields, kind of like in, in permaculture, we have like overlapping systems. Mm -hmm. um, and it's wise to spread that out so that you're not just growing your food in this one bed. And if that bed gets destroyed, you're hosed. Um, uh, I think the this, this same thing is that it's, we're gonna be looking at multiple uh, systems. I, th I think of it in two buckets. Um, there's the environmental issues, everything from ocean acidification to everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the social related issues. I, I was just talking with my kids about this uh, two days ago. It's like, it does us no good if we put all of this effort into particularly STEM education and, and we need another Albert Einstein to pop up uh, to help on the engineering side of and the science-based solutions for the climate crisis. But even if we solve all that on day one, the next day, if we are still from a societal standpoint, going down the same path of putting the garbage out there in the world and um, inequity across so many, so many issues, um, it doesn't work, right? So we have to, to me, I, I bounce back and forth between doing social justice ventures and doing environmental justice um, ventures because they go hand in hand. We've got to solve both of them approximately at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it does seem like in some respects, you know, um, the, the issues are not just the issues, but also the way we react to the issues, right? Um, yeah. uh, you know, if we know that there's going to be 100 million, you know, over 100 million or more climate refugees or climate migrants in the next 15 years, and everyone responds by closing their borders and reacting incredibly violently, right? We know we like that's, that's a human reaction. It's not that we don't have room for them, or we can't accommodate them we have exacerbated the problem by, by being, by reacting violently. Um, yeah. Are you all familiar with a, um, a meteorologist scientist type person named um, Cliff Mass? Uh, he's from up here in the Pacific Northwest. I think he's one of the professors at University of Washington, if I remember right, but he puts out a very interesting blog. Um, SJ, this, this is like right up your field, right? Like it's one senior <laughs> researcher talking to another. Anyway, Cliff put out, um, uh, a blog post probably 10, 15 years ago that I saw that really impacted me. And it was talking about, Trey, what you're talking about of, of climate refugees. And he was just looking at North America, but it's true worldwide of, of the migration strategies that are gonna have to happen, right? So in North America, that whole swath of the South, you just cannot live there anymore. Um, and all the, his basic, the basic takeaway from the map was everybody's going to come to the Pacific Northwest, so you better get ready. <laughs> so 
it was like, oh, okay, well, I am here in the Pacific Northwest. And if that is the, po the positive solution is not to turn people away or to do the stupid, typical American thing of getting out, getting out, getting out your guns, it's to do the opposite. It's to, well, how can we grow more food? How can we make it more welcoming? How can we absorb more people into this, into our communities in the Northwest? Mm. Yeah. Uh, what do you, what are you thinking, Charlotte? What are you seeing? You're in Toronto. What, what are, well, first off, what's been the reaction with Thrive Spring? Um, and how do you, how do you, how do you see things going on um, from a Canadian perspective? Um, it's been really interesting um, this 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 journey to get to to you know building the site and, and launching it has 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 been a very a very long one. We had a couple of um, sort of false starts that it, where it just didn't work out. Unfortunately, it should it should have been launched back in like 2016 or 2017 before the pandemic, in which case it would have possibly had you know been able to have be more impactful. But um, it's you know, in the in just a few years ago, when I would describe the purpose of it to people, I, I would you know get interesting reactions, and and some people would be like, oh, you mean like like I'd be like, yeah, you know, it's community resilience and emergency preparedness, and and I actually had one person respond, and like say really, quite cynically, he was like, oh, you mean like beans and bullets, and I was like, yeah, beans and bullets, like what? <laughs> no, <laughs> um, but. And, and or or just like you know not really knowing what to think of it and now when I describe it to people immediately pe everybody gets it it's like yeah yeah we need that yeah yeah we totally need to be you know working on local food production and emergency preparedness and all these things like it, it just it just it, it's just so completely different I think it might be because of all of the crazy things that have been going on for the past two and a half years not just with the pandemic but with you know like that out in BC last year the massive flooding and the wildfires and now and, and same thing happening in Europe um so yeah so the reaction has been very different um and, and you know with, f from my perspective um and I guess I'll probably sound a bit more more doomer than the rest of you even though I am also quite positive I wouldn't be doing this platform if I wasn't positive um but I I guess my concern I, I do worry about obviously about things like climate change and biodiversity collapse but even more so the kind of thing the thing that actually like keeps me up at night is how dependent we all are on this global system that is so interconnected and so interdependent mm -hmm. and it's it's the idea of of you know something going wrong in one area and the cascading failures that could trigger that's what that's what scares me um somebody i heard somebody recently describe it as you know this 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 global system that we have it's so complex that nobody can really understand it and it's like every area of critical infrastructure whether it's food production or energy or, or water or manufacturing or whatever it's like the whole thing is is one organism and each critical infrastructure sector is is an organ and if one of those organs dies if one of them collapses you know how is the rest of the, this organism going to going to survive so that's the sort of thing that motivated me to build this platform for community resilience um but as as jay said i the reason why i'm optimistic is because human beings are absolutely amazing at getting things done as long as we have the will and the coordination and the cooperation and and just that just the drive to 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 do something really big we can we can do like almost we can perform almost miracles like look at mm. i just watched a, a documentary recently on um the manhattan project look at how quickly that came together right the building the, the nuclear bomb not that it's a positive thing but you know in four years i think it was that went from nothing to that bomb because because that will was there Right. Or look at the ozone layer in the, in the 80s, how quickly that was um, solved. So I, I do think that I'm optimistic because I think that, you know, human beings can can do so much when we work together. And, we, and, and that's the whole point of this platform. It's not about coming mm -hmm. up with solutions. It's just saying, here's a platform to make it as simple as possible for you to find your people who are also interested in this sort of stuff. And then you can get connected and work together on local solutions in your area yeah 
I remember in January 2020, obviously, we talked about you know, this new coronavirus in Wuhan and, and was it something that we should be thinking about? And the general view was no, because, you know, the case fatality rate doesn't doesn't look to be that high. You know, lots of people have been killed, but it's not it's not on the par of bird flu and certainly not things like Ebola you know, or, or indeed the, the original SARS-CoV, which, which killed, I think, 60% of people infected. It was really bad. Um, but there were sort of, there were two dark clouds. The, the, the gray cloud was this problem that coronaviruses mutate really quickly and was this going to get in the way of uh, vaccination? And I think that's still a huge amount of uncertainty, sort of the degree to which the virus will escape again uh, and then you've got this trade-off between well the more it mutates the more infectious it gets but typically it gets less severe so we still hold out on that one but the thing certainly that I was worried about the whole time was going to be will this trigger any kind of disruption to the to the global food system because we do have this very extended very complex uh, system whereby food is you know take is, is allocated all around the world um, and actually, it, it, that is, you know, there is a very severe uh, famine uh, coming online now. We didn't have massive food shortages in the immediate, uh, you know, in, in, in the kind of the first wave of the pandemic and when it was worst. worst. And also, obviously, there are other factors that are, 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 um, are contributing to the the you know the, the the famines that we're starting to see in uh, in in, East, in 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 eastern central Africa and and elsewhere in the world, but it is quite possible that they, that this is actually going to be an order of magnitude or two more deadly than COVID nineteen, and actually the, COVID nineteen will have had a bigger impact on global mortality because of the disruption role it has played and continues to play in these kind of big, big global systems than it has had in terms of its biological interactions with, with the human body. Um, so yeah, I think we often ignore this because the system just works and we don't have to know how it works because we just get the stuff that we want. But that's scary. That I don't know how the food gets to me is actually a really scary thing because if I don't know how it gets to me, I don't know all the ways that it might not get to me. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, and how quickly I mean, that can happen. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're you're totally right, SJ. I mean, I I know in the doomer optimism circles, that's that's one of the the chief concerns, which is why there is so much. Like, if we really kind of boil it down, right? Like, food is very much at the heart. Uh, and, and local food systems and, and resilient food systems are really at the heart of it, which is why, you know, so many of the early kind of adopters of this mentality were homesteaders, right? Mm -hmm. Or people who are, who are or permaculturists, people who are already coming from that perspective. Um, and, and the complexity of the global food system, of course, just adds a layer of pressure, right? To, mm -hmm. to trying to figure this stuff out faster. Um, but um, I, I wanted to, I, I do want to talk about food, because it sounds like that's kind of a, a direction we can all talk about. But I want to just kind of mention something that one of the one of the things that can be very frustrating for me, I came from banking originally. And one of the things that can be very frustrating for me about the global complexity and the global capitalist system is simply that many of the problems oftentimes are actually squabbles and issues with the managerial fin financier class that have nothing to do with real world uh, supply and demand, right? So much of the issue, right, with the 2008 crash was just simply that obviously loans were getting called in and things like that, but a big part of it was just everyone panicked and seized up and wouldn't issue mm -hmm. each other credit, right? And you can have, uh, you know, I mean, Ukraine obviously is, is having a war now, but it's a part of that sh highlights it, that it's not that they're not growing grain, it's they can't get it out of the country. Right. And that yeah. issue is, of course, because of war, but it can be the same if you simply the bank that is issuing, you know, 30 percent of the of the credit on those shipping containers just isn't lending anymore or goes out of business mm -hmm. or something. And now suddenly you just have food moldering somewhere instead of getting where it's supposed to go. And for me, oftentimes knowing how fragile and, and like sus susceptible to just like uh, irrational panic. The credit system is that's the thing that that I I'm a, that gives me pause a lot because I know that it's just a matter of like 
you know, essentially, a, you know, almost like a few thousand people get spooked and suddenly it, it ripples throughout all this stuff that has really nothing to do with the real world, um, the, the real world, like the actual, like, you know, on the ground reality, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I thought it was Jamie Dimon a few, uh, a, a couple months ago said like, we're heading into a hurricane. And I mm -hmm. felt that was an incredibly irresponsible thing for him to put out there because, you know, he's spooking the general public, but more importantly, is he's spooking his, his other CEO compatriots, right. Who are really responsible, you know, when they catch a cold, you know, the whole world or they sneeze, the whole world gets a flu. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, that worries me is that, that social layer, right. Which is irrational and can affect all these real world situations, but not based on real world data. Right. Um, uh, but if you guys want to riff on that, that's fine. Otherwise, we, we can talk about food. I think food is a really, really important topic for community resilience. Well, quick, quick thought on. So that's interesting. I didn't know that was your background, Trey. But so that that layer of banking, particularly banking at a um, national or international level, uh, it, it is responsible for a, for a lot of if you do the opposite, if you look at, well, let's look at let's just strip out the national, international, let's go hyper local. So the, the largest banking uh, financial partner aspect would be like local banks, local credit unions, and that type of thing. All of a sudden, if you're building food systems, if just to stay on food as one system, if you're building locally focused food systems that are, ba that are backed by the local financial institutions, credit unions and such, you can skip over a lot of that, a lot of that um, panic that was induced that you were referring to. Um, can be mitigated. The more food you're growing within that 100 mile radius, within your 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 water, your, even your own watersheds, um, the better, right? So that even if politicking and big banking is messing things up at a at a very top scale, if you look at what's happening in your town, what's happening in your village, um, you, there are still foodstuffs traveling from point A to point B, all within the same bioregion. Yeah. Um, I mean, we do, we definitely do have this problem in the UK at the moment where because of Brexit, we have, you know, local food systems that aren't working and crops that are, are rotting in the fields because they can't get people to pick them because the, you know, post Brexit, the kind of labor restrictions make it too difficult to get people from abroad. But the, the, the global food prices mean that it's not economical to um, get, you know, uh, um, people from the UK to, to pick the crops. So it definitely, I think local is a really good solution, um, but it's, yeah, that, that, that just sort of rushing to, okay, we need to localize everything can also create problems as well. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah, there are definitely systems that operate better at scale. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it really is about a balance, right? It's about trying to find the balance of scales that, uh, that maximize resiliency in the system, right? Yeah. And I think that like, you know, we, we, it used to be all local, you know, or mostly local, not too long ago. And now I think it's tilted where everything is global and neither one of those are right, right? It really needs to be a blend of, of these things. Um, the global scale gets pretty, uh, I think global scale generally is, the, there's very few things, in my opinion, that really should be operating at a global scale. Um, but, you know, most things should be operated at least a, a, a national or a, a bioregional continental scale. Um, are, are you all familiar with um, the rule of threes, you know, old, old backpacking wisdom? Does that ring a bell for you guys? It, it does, but why don't, you, why don't you tell our audience in case they don't know? So uh, it's almost, it, it's um, the last thing in the rule of three, threes is food. And the first thing is things that are global in nature, namely air and, and climate. And so what we're talking, our focus on food and, oh, so the rule of threes is you can survive for uh, three minutes without air, three hours in lousy weather, either icy, freezing, or crazy hot desert um, heat, um, three days without water, and then three weeks without food. So, which is, most people, it's, it's a bit shocking because they get hungry first. They don't actually realize they need water before that, but what we're talking about it is almost at the end of human survival needs, mm -hmm. because that could possibly be solved partially by local stuff. But the other items, uh, the transitory nature of water, definitely with climate, 
um, in extreme weather, and then the viability of our air. Um, those are all by definition global. They're by definition international, right? You, you can't separate yourself out. Um, oh, well, only this section of the globe is going to have climate crisis things. Mm -hmm. It's going to affect all of us. Uh, it's a, uh, I, I agree with you, Trey. It's, it's, uh, and it's, it's bringing it back to um, what are these systems that are affecting literally everything around the globe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Are you guys been following what's happening in Sri Lanka with the, the no? The, what's there's an economic collapse, and then also there's a massive food crisis because of the ban on fertilizer last year. And obviously, mm. like you know, ideally we want you know more more green um, food producing methods in the in the future. But I guess when it's if if it's done too quickly. Um, I think that's right. from what I've read. It seems like it just it just happened so suddenly. And I would imagine that farmers that have been used to just using fertilizers who don't because organic farming is a completely different skill set, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, they they yeah. So there's like this this massive food crisis going on at the moment. Yeah. Which is yeah. I mean, you you were meant, you were talking about it, SJ. I mean, it's part of. You know, while you can't say it's obviously it's not directly related to COVID um, and the knock on effects of that there, it is still kind of related to the financial shenanigans we're talking about, right? Yeah. That like, there's enough food to send to uh, Sri Lanka, right? Uh, even in the, the immediate regional area, right? But the issue is that they don't, they're not, they're credit worthiness, right? And the distribution channels are not fast enough to respond yeah. to the, the rule of threes, like you're saying, Scott, right? Is that like, it needed to be, they need to respond in three weeks, right? And here we are months later, they're not responding. And so they're having an economic collapse combined with the, the food problem. Um, and yeah, I think, I believe Charlotte, that the food problem is related to the government essentially shut off, basically said, agriculture as you're doing it now is illegal. Um, and, um, I mean, that a, a, bans never work in, you know, unless you stair step it down. Um, I mean, at a very hyper local, like microcosmic level with roots down, we're working with DeKalb County to work on like a, a noise ordinance that essentially bans gas powered leaf blowers, but it's like in four years. Right. And there's rebates and things that stair step down as you adopt this stuff. I mean, you have to, you have to give people. Uh, uh, an opportunity to learn and, and adjust. Very few people can just do it like that. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it definitely seems like this is the prime example of that not working out, right? Um, even with the best intentions, right? Um, and then also because of the, the, the economic crisis, because fuel is so expensive, fishermen can't afford to put fuel in their boats you go out and get fish there's tons of fish but they can't go fishing because they can't afford to yeah so that's another way that people aren't being fed yeah, yeah. i mean i i think it's really interesting you know we have this example of, of what's going on in sri lanka and obviously before that we had a somewhat similar situation uh unfolding in lebanon and i think there is a real tendency to to think oh you know these are kind of faraway countries and they've got particular particular problems you know that aren't going to affect us but I think they're both really interesting examples about, yeah, the systemic nature of collapse and how you start off with, you know, particular problems about bad governance or, you know, um, you know, bad debt, uh, and how that just quickly takes over so many different aspects of your economy and your society, uh, and and you can't. It, it's really hard to push back. So I think we we all should be looking at what's going on in Sri Lanka and, and Lebanon. That even if there are some quite specific things to these stories, I think the real lesson there is about the way that actually societies do, uh, you know, do 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 suffer these these really catastrophic uh, drops in in you know productivity and well being, and and how that everyone gets caught up in those. Um, and and yeah, we 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 should be learning lessons from this. Yeah. I mean, we're having the same problem here in the US, you know, in that like between storms and drought and heat mm. and water being, uh, you know, uh, in, in not showing up where it's supposed to be when it's supposed to be. I mean, I think that they said that, like, you know, the you know, the, the, the old saw is, you know, corn knee high by July. Right. But with modern farming, it's more like uh, like, you know, 
up to your head uh, by July. And um, the yields look like they're going to be really rough, especially with corn. Um, and then, of course, all the wheat that's grown in Ukraine is not able to get out of Ukraine. And, um, you know, these are all issues that are going to affect uh, even the, the, the developed world, right? It may just be, it, it, you know, the problem is it's so obfuscated, right, by like so many layers of, of, um, of managerial, you know, like layers. Um, you know, how many of us are consuming like a, like wheat in any kind of raw form? Almost all of us are consuming it in the highly processed mm. form here in, here in the United States. Um, and so we'll notice it by like, you know, the little Debbie snacks are, there's less of them on the shelf, right? Or we have less choices with bread or bread is more expensive, right? Mm. Um, you know, things not being on the shelves, you know, there's a lot of there is some for the rich countries, there's a lot of resiliency built into the global system because, well, we have all the guns, right? We have military installations all around the world. We're going to get most of what we need, um, but those choices are going to become limited and they're going to be more expensive. And, um, you know, eventually that stuff can dry up, you know, I mean, these other countries can, can be like, well, we don't, we need it here. We're not shipping it to you anymore. It's not worth it, you know? Um, so yeah, it, it is, it is a global problem. You know, um, it, it, Sri Lanka is really as bad as it is because the, the West is saying, you know, and the rich countries around it are saying, we're, we're just going to, we're just accepting you as a sacrifice zone, right? They could help Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, uh, but they're not, they're not going to do it. Right. Um, so what do you think we should be doing then in terms of for, for food security and like, like just growing it everywhere like, it just, like I, I i mean that's that's my view is that yeah. I, I think that food um food production or value add food production should be something that everyone is engaged in a little bit right mm -hmm. um a, a doomer optimist who i've interviewed um personally uh william wheelwright um did a, a whole thread uh, about like if if even 10 percent of americans grew had backyard chickens right we the eggs would be everywhere. Eggs would be ridiculously cheap because everyone would have like you know two or three neighbors who could grow chickens for the whole neighbor or grow eggs for the whole neighborhood, right? Um, and of course, you got pilloried for it because people were like, you know, what are we going to go back to subsistence farming? And of course, everyone took it the complete opposite end, right? But a, a few people having backyard chickens—that's not subsistence farming. That's not working and your butt off. That's such, such a different attitude. I always go back to World War II. There's just so many awesome examples, like, but like Victory Gardens in World War II, mm -hmm. it was like, people were proud to do that. There was, you know, there wasn't, it was just every, you know, you're just chipping in and doing your bit. Yeah. And, and we stole that there. idea. You know, I have, I have a neighbor in my neighborhood who has three full-size blueberry bushes out by their mailbox. So like, yeah, I mean that they're we're not they're not solving the food problem with their blueberry bushes all by themselves because you know those three blueberries may create you know gallons and gallons of blueberries, but it's just doing it for like a two week period in June, right? Um, but they're out there, they're free. You walk by, you can grab some blueberries. You you know they're not. It is a neighborhood resource now, right? Like almost like a little free library, only with yeah. is in the states. I think you're you're from Michigan originally, right? Yeah, originally, yeah. Aren't, aren't there is isn't is it in Michigan where people are not allowed to grow vegetables in their front gardens? Oh, there's a lot of places like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, it's like against city code wow. or HOA codes. It's pure silliness. Yeah, that probably yeah. sounds crazy to you, SJ, doesn't it? Because you know England is much more forward thinking on, or maybe back I don't know if it's forward thinking. Yeah, just like yeah, it's your garden. You do what you want with it. You know, you, you're not allowed to, there's lots of restrictions about building, but I've never heard of restrictions on what you can grow. Uh, oh, yeah. But you a, got, you guys in general, I've always, I've always viewed you all as about 10 years ahead of North Americans in terms of like the fair trade movement or, uh, you know, Rob Hop, Hopkins transition towns movements. You guys are like a decade ahead of us. I, I, I mean, I think a lot of it is just our kind of, we, we all like to have our little space uh, and it's ours and you cannot have it. Um, but yeah, sure. I mean, we, we, we rent and we've, uh, you know, one of our first questions to landlords, okay, well, can we plant fruit trees? You know, because normally they they don't want you to plant anything that's going to 
to hang around, but we we need our fruit trees. Uh, and we were very glad that yeah, they were willing to see this as you know an asset for for the house going forward. Uh, so we we immediately put down roots. But it's such a it's a really lovely thing. Uh, yeah, to, to 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 grow fruits and carrots and beans and you know just a few things. Yeah. Um, Charlotte, your comment on Victory Gardens is that's ex actually exactly what we did. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, that spring, we were looking for just some kind of good news. So I asked my nonprofit to, we basically stole the Victory Gardens posters and had a local artist do new versions of Victory Gardens um, as something that's safe to do, right? It's outside, you can be socially distanced, but grow food. And it was like, it was trying to inspire that same. You're doing something. Yeah, an entire set of group, you know, pulling together for a world war, let, let's pull together for this, this war against this pandemic. Um, similarly, it's, if we go back to the, to the foodstuffs, in my mind, it is as early in the process as you can store, you know, grow, store, and, and harvest and store foodstuffs locally, the better. So, it, the, and it's actually less expensive. Like, so we, we store wheat berries, um, in which store for like 20 years, if you pack them right. Um, and the cost of a year's supply of wheat berries for a family of four is literally the same amount of dough that somebody would spend on one month's worth of processed uh, foodstuffs, uh, breads and, and, and such. And you just buy a food mill, buy wheat berries and you know, pack them right, put them away for 20 years. Now it's an inexpensive way to short circuit that um, uh, some of those issues we've been talking about, about a global food system. Yeah. Do you guys have allotments in the US? Um, is that a, a concept you're familiar with? Yeah, we call them pea patches in, in general. Um, okay. They go by a couple of different names, but um, mostly we think of them as pea patches and you can rent them. You know, yeah, exactly. by, the, by the year, by the season, um, they're they're quite popular. Yeah, no, def definitely. And I mean, you know, in general, any any community can kind of request them. Uh, but there's all they are always very popular. You know, there's no shortage of people who would really like to be growing more more food in their uh, you know in in their local community. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's a great I think it's a great scheme. And it, it does seem like. There, there is a lot of demand for that kind of that kind of facility for for people to be able to have inexpensive land just only used for the you know production of, of, of food fruit and veg and things it's great for private land but then it's also good for public land like what trey has accomplished recently with getting um a, a library system right a set of libraries to turn yeah. over trey what'd you say it was 75 acres in total? Uh, well, yeah, the total, there's 23 libraries in DeKalb County, and they sit on 75 acres. Um, we have, just to test out, show, you know, prove the model, we have converted in the last year 130,000 square feet at six mm -hmm. libraries. Um, yeah. And it's a mixture of, of edible, you know, fruit trees, uh, edible bushes and shrubs, and then a lot of wildflowers, a lot of pollinator mm -hmm. habitat. Pollinators. Um, many of this, um, the, the libraries sit near, near to like kind of forested area. So it kind of creates this ki nice kind of like riparian border between, you know, the forest and the, you know, settled area, right, where the library is. Um, and so a lot of birds, like, you know, it, it's, it's perfect habitat for birds, too, because they can hide in the forest, zoom down, get some <laughs> sunflower seeds, and then zoom back yeah. up and not be afraid of predators. Um, Great use of public space or semi-public space. Yeah. And the thing is, what's so crazy is, you know, I think, I, I also think, you know, focusing on food is because I think there's just something about, something about COVID, like just activated something in people's minds because what Roots Down was doing, like we were treated kind of like pariahs, like, oh, this is really weird. And then COVID happened and suddenly everyone got it, right? It's like, oh, wow, we need we need spaces we can go out outdoors because our libraries are going to be closed for a year. You know, um, oh, we have all this food insecurity that's gone up by 15 percent, right, because of COVID. Um, you know, it really, um, it really, you know, kind of I don't know, it activated something. I think people, maybe they felt more insecure and were like, okay, this is something I can do outside to have some control over what I'm doing. Okay, so I have a question for SJ. Yeah. Um, 
going back to CSER, is is there so so you guys do yep. research to influence policy? Is that correct? Yep. That's correct. Is there a way that is there is there an area of research that you guys could could work on in order to I don't know remove barriers to this sort of thing mm -hmm. for communities like growing food you know and obviously like you're in the UK and and the, what we were talking about was in the states but you know. Um, yeah, removing barriers to growing food in the front garden, or 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 having chickens in your back garden, or even much larger scale things. Like I'm just yeah, wondering. Yeah, yeah. What... I mean, I think what so one of the areas because you know we, we're interested in kind of really big things at the global scale. Of one of the things that we are we look a lot in is how how we can diversify the kinds of food that people eat, and how we can move to food production that is a lot more intensive and that can be incorporated into urban environments so a lot of the what we've been talking about you know it, it's things that you can do if you've got a garden or if you've got community land uh that, that's nearby but um you know a lot of people live in large cities that don't have so much of this resource and all of the green space is just very heavily used for amenity land or recreation land or other purposes um, so what can we do? What can we do for those those areas? And, you know, there's a lot of we call them future foods, uh, which is, you know, a kind of a nice way of talking about them, because these are things that people often in, instinctively don't don't much like. But, uh, like you know, we're, like eating insects. Absolutely. Uh, insects are <laughs> a very rich for, source of protein. They have been eaten all around the world uh, and you can raise them in incredibly intensely much much more intensively and without you know anything like the same welfare problems as you know intensive chicken farming or intensive uh you know pigs or, or, or cattle or whatever um also you know um like there, there's this thing called corn or microprotein which used to be the that. backbone of a lot of, of vegetarians right again what? you that it's a natural product um it's you know it's it's from the the mold family which people don't like but it is perfectly edible very nutritious very good for you and Great, <laughs> again you can uh produce it really uh really really intensively uh and and very much incorporate that within urban environments and with very low uh carbon dioxide uh and then the third thing is about producing food that maybe we don't eat but that we can use to feed uh, to defeat animals because we are you know, dealing with uh, a lot of people do want to eat meat or do want to eat other animal products. So there's also things like blue green algae uh, and, and other things that are very good nutritious animal feed um, and that we don't have to you know grow all of these soybeans and turn them into cattle feed that again we can we can have good feed systems um some of them we can even grow on you know brackish water uh, so we don't even need to uh, you know, take fresh potable water out of our systems to grow this stuff. And all of these things also have the advantages that you can grow them modularly. So you you have, you know, a system, you have a hydroponic system, or you have a single greenhouse or something, and it's entirely under your control. You know, it's not vulnerable to, to changes in the climate or extreme weather events and so on. You know, you can have local food production in the most high population density areas, but it's not it's not the way that we think about these things. And, and it is, you know, one of the reasons we call it future foods is that a lot when we start talking about global, you know, local food production and all of this, we want to go back to, to victory gods. We want to go back to the way things were done before. And there is definitely wisdom in that. But there are also things that we haven't tried that seem like they have a lot, uh, a lot of, of, of promise and that we can move towards. And, you know, in some time people will, We'll see this as just as normal as anything else. Um, so yeah, we think there there are many more creative ways that we can localize the food system that go beyond this this nice kind of semi-rural, uh, you know, <laughs> peasant farming or whatever you want to call it. Um, that that we our mind immediately goes to when we think of this stuff. Yeah, I think of it that also is that there's this balance that we want to strike between um, preparedness work and community work. Uh, and and then also the, our collective search for climate crisis solutions mm -hmm. and mitigation strategies. Right, that we can't just do one or the other. We need to. No. We need to do both. Yeah, it is. I mean, we're we're facing. You know, I I I kind of come around to the idea 
that overshoot really is is our problem right and climate change is the worst of the symptoms of that but um it is all just a matter of like the, the systems we have built are just just using up the resources faster than they can be replenished right and mm -hmm. We're, you know, we could solve climate change, but we still have the plastic problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, um, you know, and uh, even overshoot in, in financial and social systems, right? Where we're using, you know, more people, uh, smaller uh, groups of people are using too many resources, too much social capital, uh, and too much actual capital, and there's not enough for everyone else, right? And mm -hmm. it's all just kind of wrapped up in this sense of overshoot. Um, you know, I, I think about this a lot because I feel like the two most dominant solutions being put forward is, you know, uh, agrarian peasant far farming, right? Small farming villages, right? And then, you know, tall cement boxes with vines hanging off the edge and solar powered, you know? And I feel like e both of those are really like... Um, they're really 20th century fever dreams, right? They're neither one of them is likely to happen uh, or is, or, is, or they're gonna happen concurrently um, or we need to find some blend of the two of those um, because not everyone wants to live in a rural village, right? Um, and people wanna live in a lot of different types of arrangements. Um, and so we should be thinking about solutions that can mm. be maybe hyper-specific to a certain type of, of uh, human development, right? Versus yeah. others. Um, or maybe broadly applicable uh, in just, you know, kind of cut differently for the, the, the local circumstances. I've got a related question for SJ. So um, in, in many of the circles that I run in, the, the elephant in the room that never gets talked about or that people talk about in hushed tones is overpopulation because mm -hmm. it's like a total doomer topic, right? But if we're, yeah. we're on a podcast called Doomer Optimism, we... Talk about both because everything we're talking about food, right, is because we have got a kajillion human beings that we're trying to feed, yep. both locally, regionally, and internationally. Um, same issues for potable water pressures and, and other things up in in those systems. Um, what are what's your research group um, thinking in terms of of uh, the existential risk related overpopulation? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously. It's a very contested subject. It's one I think is really important, but we, you know, we need to be uh, careful about how we talk about it and how we think about it. Uh, so one one thing that I keep on coming back to is, if you look at uh, what's it called? Is it the Global Overshoot Institute? The people who, you know, who research the kind of the, you know, how how far over how far we are overshooting the Earth's capacity to sustain us in all sorts of different economic ways. Um, uh, and and you know the their findings are that kind of since they started uh, it, you know looking at this um, their data goes back to the beginning of, of the 1960s you know we've moved from using you know the equivalent of 0.7 percent of the Earth's resources to 1.7 percent uh, sorry no sorry from 0.7 Earths to 1.7 Earths which you know so now we are having to rely very heavily on unsustainable overuse of resources which is a huge problem and if you look at it it's a really dramatic rise but the actual per capita uh use of the earth's environmental resources has not really changed it goes up and down a bit uh over time uh depending on various factors you know it went down quite a bit during the oil crisis of the 1970s it, it, it went up a, a bit uh kind of in the in the 90s and early 2000s but it is now basically the same as it was at the beginning of the 1960s even though you know at the beginning of the 1960s the, i think the global population life expectancy was 40 and now it's 70 and you know many many a much much smaller percentage of people are living in absolute poverty and the wealthiest are incredibly much wealthier and a lot of other people are somewhat better off than they were so material living standards have improved but we have found ways of doing that without our per capita environmental impact rising significantly and i think that's it's such a fascinating result um, that we we actually have achieved that over the last 50 60 years but we still have this massive overshoot and that has risen as you can tell sort of absolutely proportionally with increase is in the world's population. Now, there's then a question about whether whether we should talk about this as overpopulation. And 
you know, one, one view is, well, we should because, you know, we are in overshoot and it seems like population increase has been a significant driver or the significant driver of us entering overshoot. So this is a kind of overpopulation. But there's another view that says it's probably not the case that we can't support 8 billion people, that 8 billion people can't live good lives. Managing to, you know, increase average, um, uh, you know, quality of life four or five times without increasing our uh, environmental impact per capita significantly kind of implies that we probably could keep our, you know, living standards equal or let them grow a bit and actually have cut our, you know, environmental impact down so that we could fit 8 billion people on the world. It's just that's a problem. And it's a problem mm -hmm. that we need to address and we need to, to talk about and think about. So I think it's to not talk about population is, I think, intellectually dishonest because we are human beings. We are animals. We have a population just like any other, you know, group of animals has a population. You know, there are 10,000 tigers. There are 8 billion humans. There are, uh, you know, I think 700 billion chickens or something. Uh, I'm not I, I can't I'm not convinced I've got any of those figures right apart from the humans. But, you know, all these animals have a population. We have a population. And that has a lot to say about our impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. But we what we need to do is we need to work out the way that 8 billion people can live good lives without, you know, meaning that there can't be any tigers or elephants and that probably our own days are numbered uh, because these people aren't going anywhere and we shouldn't expect people to go anywhere or we shouldn't expect people to give up their you know reproductive autonomy i think we should expect people to be free from you know coercion to reproduce when they don't want to which is still a really big problem uh, even in kind of the uk and usa and uh you know e an even bigger problem in some other parts of the world we do need to deal with that we do need to give people the freedom to control their own fertility as they wish. But we shouldn't, I think, be saying you have had, you know, more children. I think it's rather collectively as a species, we need to solve the problem of these are the people who are alive on the earth and they can all flourish. But it's there are many difficult challenges for uh, achieving that end state. So I see it as a challenge, but not necessarily a problem of overpopulation, so to speak. What would you say to somebody who says that the problem is is that our population is going to collapse? Because I've been hearing that mm -hmm. quite a bit the past couple of months. I, I mean, mean I, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. But oh well, <laughs> a, a lot of that kind of assumes that there is. You know, demography is not a very precise science. Uh, when you look at the way that people make population projections, a lot of it is linear forecasting. A lot of it says, this is what has happened in the last 10 years. Therefore, we think this is what is going to happen. You know, we think the same thing or more or less the same thing will happen in the next 10 years. And actually, that's not true. That, you know, people's, everyone's decision whether or not to have children is incredibly personal and there are many 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 different factors that feed into this and those factors are changing all the time so you know for instance we know that uh education has had a very significant impact on people's uh decisions as to whether or not to have children but it's certainly not the case that you know going to university means you will have less children. It may mean you have lots of children and you're just better educated. You know, that will depend on how education fits in with your economic chances and your life partner and your sexuality and the cultural background you come from and a whole men a whole range of other things. Um, so you can produce some of these kind of quite basic linear models that says, okay, you know, birth rates are declining. So we'll just assume that they're going to carry on declining at the, the relatively fast rate that we've seen forever. And then eventually everyone's going to stop having children and the population is going to crash. Right? That is, you can definitely make models that say that. It seems unlikely that we are going to have that kind of linear trend. Actually, what we've seen is, you know, even in like very wealthy countries, you get waves and all of a sudden, you're lots of people be having children and they see other people in their cohort having children and they get broody themselves and you get these little baby booms and baby busts happening all the time. Um, and probably we're going to have that kind of bumpy, lumpy uh, future. And as I say, it's just it's a matter of making sure that we don't see human beings as, you know, the, the human beings 
can be a problem. But uh, well, okay, let me. Uh, I mean, this this is the way I often put it that you know population is a problem, but that doesn't mean that population control is a solution. That you know population decline could be a problem, but that doesn't mean that telling everyone they've got to have kids is a solution. Um, because we are talking about human beings with dignity and autonomy and freedom and rights. We are not talking about, you know, just units in the economy that we can do with whatever we wish. And so we need to be much more creative and engaged in how we think about the solutions for making sure that all of these people that we have alive can live well and that humanity can continue to flourish for a long time to come. Yeah, I, I get that. That also speaks to me to what's the attitude that you, you look at these topics with? There's, mm -hmm. To me, I, I see there's two attitudes I run across a lot. There's either fear-based people, people are just, they are scared and that's how they come at this. Uh, or there's people that are more community-minded. In my, in my world, if, if you look at it through the, if you look at preparedness and, and um, disaster work through this lens of fear, that might inspire fast action, but it it doesn't stick, and and it's actually and it's inherently negative, and you end up building a town or a village or a neighborhood that's not really enjoyable to live in. Mm -hmm. um, you do the opposite, and and you approach these topics through this lens of love and community building. Well, now, well, in our case, for earthquakes in the greater Seattle area, even if the earthquake doesn't happen for another fifty years, we have still built neighborhoods that are enjoyable to live in, yep. right? Um, even if we don't have another pandemic for a decade or two or three, we are still creating neighborhoods and villages um, and cities that are enjoyable uh, to be in. It's, mm -hmm. to You're the, combating isolation, all the, all the modern yeah. skills, right? Yep, exactly. That attitude's so important. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of, one of the things I think people often miss about overpopulation is Right now, the major contributor to population growth, and this will get even more so in the future, is population aging. As I said, you know, life expectancy used to be 40 years. Now it's 70 years. That mm -hmm. change is having a more significant impact now to the number of people who are alive than the number of, of, of births every year. And I think if you look at it like that, anyone who says, oh, the population's aging, therefore the solution must be euthanasia, right? No, that that is just such a non sequitur, right? Oh, the population is aging, so we need to make sure that people die sooner. No, what you need to do is you need to change society so that it, you know, old people have a better quality of life and are more able to, you know, continue contributing to their communities and to the economy and to, you know, play a part. That's, that's the humane and sensible solution that makes everyone's lives better. Even though you say, this growth in life expectancy is huge and is transforming our societies and is making many like really difficult problems. You know, I am very unsure if I will have a pension or what it will look like. That does not mean that we should kill off all the elderly people. It means we need to think about long-term, you know, financing of pensions and, and labor market participation of elderly people and also a lot of sick and disabled people who have always been, you know, uh, cast out of the labor force, um, but now, you know, it's just becoming more and more normal to be a sick and disabled person who is playing a full part in society because that's important and that will become more and more important as time goes on. So yeah, we, however dire the problem is, the solution is always to aim for something good, not to just, you know, try and meet your dire problem with an even more dire solution that's, that's kind of antithesis and hope that somehow those two direness uh, cancel each other out. Yeah, that's all. That's all really, really well said. I, I've really appreciated this whole. I, I thought there was a very nuanced discussion of this. I, I, I really like SJ how you kind of frame it as, um, it is a problem, but it you know it doesn't necessarily require um, a, a drastic solution, top down solution, right? Um, and you know, I know that I know for a lot of doomer optimists, like that is one of the things that that another strain is this kind of fear of unintended consequences of large scale top down um, uh, so solutions to problems. I mean, the one child policy in China, of course, is a is a perfect example of all the unintended consequences that that flowed from that decision. Um, I wonder, I, 
I don't, I mean, I personally don't think of overpopulation. I, I don't even think of it as overpopulation. I, th- I, we, I know we have enough food resources um, to, for 8 billion people to have um, uh, flourishing lives, not necessarily in the way that, uh, you know, Kylie Jenner has a flourishing life, right? And I think that that was, that was the mm. good bill of goods sold to us by neoliberalism, right? Is that like, we're going to raise everyone up to the American standard, and that is completely unsustainable. That's not mm. possible. But there is a flourishing, beautiful life possible for 8 billion people on this planet. It just requires essentially rethinking most of our systems, most of our global systems, um, which you know, that's sort of one of the optimistic parts of all of this is that I think that the future, the way things are going are going to require, we either rethink these and institute new types of systems, or we know we're going, we're just going to go off a cliff, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, the first thing to go will will not be humans, it will be civilization, it will be society as we understand it. I, I think humans I think the the full scale extinction of humans is highly unlikely, you know, Um, but what will it look like? How much suffering is involved in that in those changes? Um, And at this point, we're aware of it as as a as a global civilization, we are aware of it. And so whatever we do from here on out is our choices. These are choices we're making. These are not Mm -hmm. things that were just hoisted on us that we didn't weren't aware were coming. We know we know what's coming to a certain degree. And we're making choices about how we're going to react to that. Um, I did want to, I wanted to bring up one last topic. um, And then we're kind of, we're we're running out of time. I want to be uh, really conscious of your, your, your all's time. Um, I wondered what everyone's feelings are about the rewilding movement. I know that, that, uh, you know, George Monbiot is very vocal and, and uh, involved in, in UK politics and, and that movement in the UK. Um, does anyone have any strong feelings about it one way or another? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm strongly pro. We have uh, a little, uh, it, it, it's a field that 20 years ago, the farmer just stopped plowing. And it's also a field that local people had always trespassed on, you know, just walked across. Uh, and it's been really amazing how it kind of developed. Uh, as you know, somewhere that was let alone, but there was also a very human-centered landscape with people walking through it and you know keeping paths open just by being there, being the large mammals moving through the landscape. And it has developed in a way that is so much more interesting to every local nature site where someone is just like, okay, we're going to plant a lot of trees because trees are good. And you get these kind of closed canopy, you know, six or seven different species of trees, and they're all the same. This is kind of really every little every little patch of this field has developed in a different way you know there are bits that really have succeeded through to quite well established woodland there are bits that are completely open and there are rabbits that have kept the turf down there are bits that are long grass or scrub or lots of different ways and i just love being there i love feeling this negotiation between all the different, you know, the deer and the birds and the trees and the rabbits and the foxes and the badgers and the humans. And we're just all kind of negotiating around each other to make something that we all like uh, and that works for us. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's so much richer and more varied than than anything else I've seen close by. Uh, And then, yeah, during the pandemic, came you know the farmer uh, they died and and the whole estate was up for sale and we were part of a, a local effort to buy it and you know my partner is a trustee uh a, a, you know for the charity that has managed to buy it and it's just it's really lovely and i think compared to what we normally do when we think about nature uh it just it just seems so much more authentic uh and the end results are so much more powerful as a and and we have turtle doves which are a very very rare uh, Mm. bird nowadays and they've come to nest here because they really like this kind of you know going back to the permaculture all the edges between all these tiny little different habitats in this space and they really thrive on that so yeah it seems to be working out very well i'm a massive fan of rewilding um i uh whether it's letting nature take its course or doing kind of guerrilla gardening. Um, it, it reminds me of um, Heather Joe Flores's book. Uh, you all have probably read it. Um, food, food, not lawns, you know, mm-hmm. play off of the food, not bombs thing from the sixties. Mm-hmm. And um, where she talks about urban lots, you know, that are 
disused, un underutilized absentee landowners that don't even show up in that city. They have no idea what's going on in that lot. And, and nature starts to take that back over. And I like then the human interaction of, of even if you're going out at midnight and surreptitiously planting um, foodstuffs or throwing seed bombs um, out the window for pollinators. Uh, uh, in my mind, rewilding is a good solution, uh, both when it's done on purpose, like as SJ was describing, you know, and, or letting a, a field go fallow on purpose as wise farmers do, um, or whether you're going guerrilla style and you are actively re actively doing direct action to, to reclaim that land and um, bring back pollinators and such. Um, I've only just recently come across that term and I was, uh, I, actually I came across a thread, Trace, you've probably seen it. Um, it was by uh, the farmer, Chris, I think you guys have interviewed Chris him. Mage? Chris Mage, yeah. yeah. Um, he was reviewing the book by George Mumbai and I haven't read the review yet, but I want to. Um, but I mean, rewild the way you guys have described it. It sounds absolutely beautiful. But I'm I'm very interested in reading this this review of, of Chris. Yeah, I I love rewilding, um, and um, I'm really impressed with by a uh, an organization called Sugi, uh, and they're uh, the Milwaukee method of of afforestation. And um, they you spell that? Is that S U G I? S U G I. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think they're out of the Netherlands. Um, but they're, um, they're just planting like pocket forests all over the world, wherever they can find a space, right? And they, they kind of intentionally plant a forest that's going to be very biodiverse, even down to, I think they've done them as low, small as like a thousand square feet, right? Very small areas, yep. um, even like uh, road verges and things like that. Um, I think we, you know, where my, my concern sometimes lies with the, the movement as a whole is just this kind of um, techno utopianism of like, there'll be the wild areas and then there'll be the human areas, which remind me of like um, a little bit of like, um, oh gosh, uh, Lee Corbusier, right? His yep. vision of just like towers among grass, you know? And mm -hmm. I, I feel like, you know, that doesn't, it sort of doesn't solve the actual psychological social problem of not living in nature's envelope, right? Is that in many yeah. respects, if rewilding is great, but we also have to kind of rewild our urban spaces. We need to invite nature back in. We need to get rid of the cars to whatever degree we can. Um, and we need to start making them much more human, natural. I mean, I've really kind of latched onto the term natural urbanism, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like a new urbanism 2.0, right? Like a natural urbanism that brings nature back into the urban environments, brings the farm back into the urban environment um, so that we don't have to have so much of this like, you know, binary, like I'm going to live in a box and then I can go, you know, drive 20 minutes to go visit nature, right? It should be we should be living among it. Um, science backs it up all over the place. Like greenery in some capacity um, is, uh, you know, uh, like I think correlated with like a 50% um, reduction in like um, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder and other kind of psychological disorders. I mean, we are, we are a species that is meant to be around nature and natural systems. And when we're yeah. not, we become neurotic, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, the the recent rise of of the, the term forest bathing out of Japan, you know, it's you know, <laughs> walking through the forest on a regular basis. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's there's another aspect of rewilding that is interesting, which is the time aspect. Right, mm -hmm. we need to act as quickly as we can because some things like like out here in the Northwest, dam removal as that aspect of rewilding is a huge one, but. You can model what's going to happen when you remove a dam, where, what the water flows, but you don't really know until nature does its thing. And so we need to allow months and years and decades for that to happen, for that rewilding to happen. So the, the, the sooner, to me, there's a, this, there's a, an impetus to go as fast as you can with rewilding as quick as you can. Yeah. Well, excellent. Does anyone have any like kind of last thoughts? I guess actually what I'd like to do is kind of go through and everyone just kind of tell our audience how they can get in touch with you in the future. You know, like what's a good way to interact with you or find more information about your work. Um, one of the, the downsides of a panel discussion is that each individual doesn't really get the 
the level of detail that I'd normally like to go into. Um, you're absolutely, I would like to extend an invitation to all of you to be on the podcast again, either as a host, um, if you have someone that you'd really like to interview or have a conversation you'd like to have, once you've been as a guest on the show, you can be a host in the future um, or just on the podcast as an individual. So we can kind of dive more into your individual work. Um, but why don't we start with you, Scott? How can people kind of follow you and get more involved in what you're doing? Um, I'll, I'll give you two, two websites. Um, one for the book, you can look at preparedneighborhoods.com. Um, and that'll tell you more about the book. It's got contact info on there and ways to reach out to me. Um, and also all the appendices um, from the book are, are there as free PDFs, which is like a go bag checklist, a shelter in place checklist to get home from work for the last time after a giant earthquake checklist, that kind of thing. Um, and then the second website would be my nonprofit, um, bainbridgeprepares.org. Um, I'll put both of those in the chat. And that, the nonprofit is a replicatable um, uh, thing. What, what is, we're working on a replication kit now, but I'm convinced what has taken us 10 years to build with a replication kit, to, kit can take, uh, allow other cities to do it in two years, just very fast. It's a unique partnership between a city, a fire district, and a citizen-driven nonprofit that can cut through all the red tape when the other two are bogged down. We don't have to ask permission. Um, in fact, we kind of do the opposite and just get scolded later, but we keep going, make progress. Excellent. What so about you, Both Sharon? of those have got my contact info on it. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, what about you, Charlotte? Um, so the website is thrivespring.com. Um, we've also just just set up a forum, haven't yet integrated it into the site, but it's, uh, it's, it's thrivespring.com community.forum uh but although when we get it connected then it'll just be like it'll just be the, the, the same domain as the main platform um and i also just wanted to give a plug to the electric infrastructure security council website um i think it's eiscouncil.org um because they talk about um you know what what can be what we can be doing on, like on a country scale for um you know, securing the grid and nuclear power plants and things like that. And, and, and they, um, I think that, that there should be a lot more, <laughs> people should know more about the EIS because they're doing some really good work. So uh, actually, I think they're connected to CSER, aren't they? Uh, we've, we've worked with them before, but uh, there isn't any uh, collaboration ongoing at the moment. But yeah, we're definitely okay. second that they do really good work. Yeah. Charlotte, you said that was the Electric Infrastructure Council. There was another Security word. Council. Security Council. Okay, thank you. And what about S uh, USJ? How can you yeah know uh, about your work? I will tell you. I also I'm just going to uh, abuse the ending of this by going back to the last question because there was one one thing I wanted to say, which I just <laughs> wanted to reaffirm this kind of not getting distracted into thinking that rewilding is about removing humans from nature. Uh, you know, if if I have a grand unifying vision of existential risk, I think one of the big things I would say is we are alive you know, you are alive, you are an animal who finds yourself in a situation that animals do not normally find themselves in. And one of the things that I think just explains so much of what has happened to human beings is we have escaped our, our ecological niche. Uh, just like, you know, the algae in a pond who find that there's a lot more, uh, you know, nutrients have come in, there's been a landslide somewhere, or, you know, nowadays maybe a, a, a a fertilizer leak or something and there's lots of nutrients and they bloom and then you know alas they turn the the water anoxic and they all die again and then they all uh you know rot at the bottom and and like this cycle just goes through over and over again we are an animal who for very different reasons has escaped our ecological niche and i do think that in the long term the you know the solution to our problem is finding that niche again it's finding that place where we are not separate from separate from nature. And I think rewilding is about rewilding our environments, but it is also about rewilding ourselves. And, you know, the, the long-term goal of sustainability is just, you know, everything that is a waste to you is food to something else. That's how ecosystems work, is everyone lives off everyone else's waste and the whole thing just gets cycled round and it's completely sustainable. Uh, and yeah, I, I so, definitely strongly 
want to encourage everyone do do think about in terms of safety and security and the long term about how can I lean in to this relationship with nature. Anyway, I'm I'm SJ Beard and yeah, um, the website is cser.ac.uk. Uh, we always talk about ourselves as Caesar, uh, and there's a newsletter that I write every month uh, for, for the Institute as a whole. Um, and I'm at Caesar SJ on Twitter, CSERSJ, one word on Twitter. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. This has been a really lovely conversation. Thanks for having us. Yeah.